Hey everyone, welcome back to the class. Uh, this week we're talking about famine, affluence, and morality, which is a paper by philosopher Peter Singer, who is a utilitarian, uh, but his utilitarian views don't directly come up in this paper. Uh, he's, the, he's a contemporary philosopher. He's one of the, he might be the only philosopher we've read so far who's still alive right now. Uh, but he, as far as I know, he is still alive right now. So this is contemporary recent stuff. This paper was written in the late 20th century. And the paper is an argument about morality. So in the last couple of weeks, we read and talked about Kantianism, which is a whole theory of morality. Uh, and we talked about utilitarianism, which is again, is a whole theory of morality that says uh, what it means for something to be morally right or morally wrong. Singer's not talking about that though. This paper is not trying to give a theory of what it means for an action to be morally right or what it means for an action to be morally wrong or what makes actions right or wrong. Instead, this paper is an argument for a specific moral claim. And that moral claim is essentially that uh, we should be donating all of the resources that we can spare without dying, uh, without hurting ourselves. We should donate all of our resources that we can spare to starving people, uh, people going through famines, uh, people dying, in the world because there are people who without our donations will die and so we can either spend our money on saving their lives or on like shoes and going out to dinner and clothes and a new couch and whatever we spend our money on uh day to day so if this argument is sound if this argument is uh valid with true premises then we are all doing something morally wrong almost all the time. Every time you buy a cup of coffee, you're doing something morally wrong. Every time you uh, buy a new pair of shoes or a new t-shirt or a new coffee mug, new pencil, the, if it's not absolutely necessary for your survival, then you're doing something morally wrong, according to this argument. Paying tuition is probably morally wrong, according to this argument, because going to college won't determine whether you live or die, but the money you spend on tuition could determine whether someone lives or dies if you donate it to uh, famine relief or uh, malaria nets or something like that. So we want to look at this argument. Uh, I, I think we should want to look at this argument, partly because I just think it's an interesting argument. It's it, this argument does what all good philosophical arguments do. Uh, it starts with premises that seem obviously right, and then makes inferences, makes argumentative steps that seem obviously valid, uh, that seem obviously good, and then ends at a conclusion that seems obviously wrong. So we learn something, even if we end up rejecting the argument, we learn something uh, from the argument. Because we learned some, we were wrong about something. Either one of the premises we believed, we should now stop believing, or the conclusion that we didn't believe before, we should now start believing. So we should learn something from this argument, regardless of what we end up saying about it. Maybe we learned that we've been morally wrong our whole lives up until now. That's a possibility. Uh, so maybe you'll agree with him by the end of this, maybe you won't, but I'm gonna to try to present his argument as clearly as I can. So there's only gonna be one video this week and it's this video, uh, but once you sort of take away all of Singer's uh, examples in his detail, the argument's actually pretty straightforward and simple. So this video I'm hoping will not be too long. So there's not a lot of lecture time this week. So I want you to spend that time really thinking hard about this argument and whether or not you think it's right. What are our moral obligations when it comes to charity? What are our obligations when it comes to how we spend our money? 
because that is a question worth asking. So the argument in this paper, the title of the paper is Famine, Affluence, and Morality, but the argument in the paper is often called the drowning child argument because it starts with the example of a drowning child. So Singer makes some background assumptions in the paper. And he says he's not going to argue for them. He's just going to assume that we all agree with them. So background assumption number one is that there are people around the world who are dying painful, preventable deaths. So people around the world are right now dying deaths, uh, but not just any deaths, painful deaths and painful deaths that could be prevented. Uh, they, have, they are dying of diseases that we have cures for. They are dying of a lack of food when other areas of the world have too much food, have a surplus of food. They are dying of uh, you know, diseases that can be prevented with vaccines. So even if we don't have a cure for the disease, disease we might have vaccines. Uh, so these people, around the world are dying deaths that could be prevented if we put our resources into trying to prevent those deaths then the deaths would be prevented so that's a background assumption he's making and that he thinks is just empirically factually correct if you look at the news uh you will see that this is factually correct there are people dying from diseases that we have cures for around the world and that is a preventable death. So people are dying of famine, lack of access to water and shelter, which uh, obviously there is enough water that we could provide water. We could put resources into providing water. Uh, dying due to lack of water when there are, you know, whole lakes of potable drinking water is that's a preventable death. And so these are all avoidable causes of death and suffering, and they're happening, happening all around the world. So if medicine or water or food or malaria nets or vaccines or whatever it is that would prevent the death is provided to the people in question, these people, uh, then they will survive rather than dying. Right, so that's his first assumption. Just people around the world are dying painful, preventable deaths. And that is factually Correct. If you, if you look at the news, that's just a fact of the world. This isn't like a philosophical assumption. Uh, this is just something that he takes to be true because he's read a newspaper before. And so he's not going to waste time arguing for it. His second background assumption is that suffering is bad. Right. So he just he's not going to argue for the claim that suffering is bad. He's not going to try to give a justification for why it's bad. He's just assuming that starving to death and dying of disease are bad things. Uh, he says, I begin with the assumption that suffering and death from lack of food, shelter, and medical care are bad. I shall not argue for this view. So he doesn't think he should have to argue for it. He thinks anyone who doesn't accept this can't be reasoned with and should be uh, ignored from now on. And we should focus on talking to the people who understand that suffering is bad and understand that starving to death is bad. So those are his background assumptions. Those aren't part of the argument uh, exactly. They're just sort of in the background uh, rather than being steps of the argument or premises that he tries to defend. So now with those background assumptions in place, now Singer uh, introduces a thought experiment. And it's not a really far out there, sort of crazy complicated thought experiment. It's not a utility monster or experience machine sort of sci-fi fantasy thought experiment. This is a very realistic scenario that probably, I say probably, it has definitely happened multiple times in the real world. So this is a real thing. Uh, this is not a crazy fantasy. This is just a hypothetical case that's very grounded. Uh, it's close to reality. So here's the thought experiment. 
Suppose you walk past a child drowning in a shallow lake, right? So you are tall enough that you can easily wade into the lake. You can walk into the lake. Even if you can't swim, you can walk into the lake and you can save the child's life. It says you're, by doing so, your pants will get wet. You might ruin your shoes, but otherwise you'll be fine. You will face some economic uh, and mild economic uh, negative effects because you'll have to buy new pants and shoes. Uh, and you'll face some mild discomfort because you'll be wet and being wet and walking around with wet shoes is kind of unpleasant. But he says that's, that those little sort of minor inconveniences of saving the child uh, are not as important as the child's life. So he says in this case, do we think that we have a moral obligation to save this drowning child? If you see a child drowning in a lake and you can easily walk in and save the child, do you have a moral obligation to save that child? And this is not a trolley problem scenario. This is not a, oh, well, if you save the child, then five people will die. This is nothing like that. If you save the child, then the child doesn't die and your pants are wet and that's it. If you don't save the child, then the child dies and your pants are dry. And that's it. So there's no catch here. There's no weird philosophy thought experiment type of uh, shenanigans in the background. Uh, it's just, do you walk in and save a child when there's no downside to saving the child, except that your pants get wet. And Singer says, yes, we have a moral obligation to save the child. He says, it is not okay. It's not morally permissible to let the child drown. It would be morally wrong to stand there and do nothing and watch the child drown rather than just walking in and saving the child. So walking past a child drowning in a shallow lake, you can easily save them. Peter Singer says, of course you should save the child. You morally ought to save the child. It is wrong for you to see a drowning child, know that you can save them and choose not to save them because you don't want to get your shoes wet. Like that's obviously morally reprehensible, Singer thinks. That's obviously wrong. So you do have a moral obligation to save the child in this case. You obviously have a moral obligation to save the child. It would be morally wrong to walk by mumbling, well, that's not my problem. No, that would be bad. You shouldn't do that. Uh, if you see a child drowning, you should save them. Uh, morally speaking, you cannot let the child drown. Obviously, it's physically possible to do that. But morally speaking, it's not. It's not okay. It's not possible. You must save the child. That's a moral obligation you have. But what about your wet clothes? You, your shoes get ruined. Your pants get ruined. Maybe it was expensive, uh, your shoes and your pants that you ruined. Maybe you were in head to toe suede and it, none of it will survive getting wet. When you dry it, it'll be permanently ruined. What then? Let's, if you will ruin your pants and shoes, does that mean that you no longer have an obligation to save the child? If your pants and shoes are expensive and you don't wanna ruin them, does that make it okay for you to let the child drown? No. Singer says no. You have to save the child, even if it ruins your shoes, even if it ruins your clothes, even if you'll be wet and a little uncomfortable afterwards, you have to save the child. It's still morally obligatory. It's morally necessary for you to save that child. So ruining your pants and shoes is a sacrifice that you are making, but it's a very small one compared to the life of a child. Uh, rather than letting your 
pants and shoes stay dry and letting a child drown. Singer says, you obviously ought to ruin your pants and shoes and save that child's life. Because he says, you aren't giving up anything nearly as valuable as the life of a child. Your pants and shoes, no matter how nice they are, no matter how well they go together, no matter how good they look on you, they are not as valuable as the life of a person. The drowning child's life is worth more than your clothes, no matter what clothes you might have on. So if you don't save the child, Singer thinks, then you are at least implicitly suggesting that your pants are worth more than the child's life. You're saying, I have a choice. I can uh, save a life and ruin my pants and shoes, or I can save my pants and shoes and a child dies. And you are choosing to save your pants and shoes so that a child dies. It says that means you think your pants and shoes are worth more than a child's life. And that is clearly wrong. Your pants and shoes are not as valuable as the child's life. You will be less happy not having those shoes anymore, probably. Maybe you hated the shoes, but let's assume they're nice shoes that you liked and you just got. Not having them anymore will make you less happy, but the child's life is still worth more. So that means you have to save the child, even if it means making small sacrifices. As long as you don't sacrifice anything as valuable as a child's life, you have a moral obligation to save the child. So Singer doesn't think you should save the child no matter what. Like if you have to drown two children in order to save this one drowning child, Singer doesn't think you should do that. You shouldn't make that trade. Uh, you shouldn't trade two deaths for one death. That's a terrible trade. But if we're talking about like mild physical discomfort and sort of uh, short-term fiscal impacts, short-term financial setbacks, that's not nearly as important as a child's life. You being a little cold and wet for a few hours and having some less money now because you will have to buy new shoes and pants to replace those, that doesn't mean, uh, that doesn't come close to the value of the child's life. The fact that you make these sacrifices, these like short-term financial and comfort type sacrifices, that doesn't mean that you don't have to save the child. What you're sacrificing, what you're giving up is not worth as much as a child's life. And therefore, it is wrong for you not to save the child's life. You have to make those small sacrifices in order to save the child's life. So that's what Singer argues. Now, question, which I'm a little worried my face is going to block the end of here in this video. Uh, the question is, does it matter if other people can help? Does it matter if other people could save the drowning child? Does that change your obligation? So let's look at it. So uh, Singer asks, what if there are other people standing around doing nothing while this child is drowning? So suppose you're at the lake, you walk by, there are a bunch of other people watching the child drown and doing nothing. They're all also adult sized. They could also wade into the lake and uh, save the child, but they aren't doing it. Maybe they're just, uh, maybe they don't notice the child. Maybe they are all standing around saying, man, someone should do something, but none of them are actually doing anything. It's called the bystander effect. I believe it's on the cognitive bias uh, poster. We didn't talk about it in class, but bystander effect, it's a real thing. So maybe that's what's happening here. These people are all standing around hoping someone will do something, but none of them are actually doing anything. Maybe they're all making the morally bad choice to uh, save their pants and shoes in exchange for letting the child die. They're choosing not to make the small sacrifice to save the child. So maybe they're uh, hoping someone else will step in. Maybe they just don't care, whatever. Uh, the, the important point is not why they're doing nothing, but the fact that they're doing nothing. So there are a bunch of other people now 
standing around who could help, who could save the drowning child, but they aren't doing it. So if any of them saved the drowning child, well, then the drowning child would be saved and you wouldn't have to save the drowning child. But as a matter of fact, none of them are doing anything. None of them is helping. None of them is saving the drowning child. Now, so that's the new version of the thought experiment. New, now there are a bunch of people standing around. What do we do? Is it okay now for you to do nothing? Is it morally permissible not to help the child now that there are a bunch of other people also failing to help the child? Does a bunch of other people not doing the right thing make it okay for you not to do the right thing? Singer says, no. No, it does not. Even if there are other people around who could help but are doing nothing, you still have an obligation to help. He says, the other people also have an obligation to help. They're not off the hook. They each have an obligation to save the drowning child. But the fact that none of them are fulfilling their obligation to save the child, the fact that none of them are actually saving the child, that does not mean it's okay for you not to save the child. The fact that they're shirking their moral responsibilities does not mean it's okay for you to shirk your moral responsibilities. The fact that they have failed to live up to their obligations does not mean that you now can fail to live up to your obligation. So the fact that other people aren't saving the child doesn't mean that you don't have to save the child. In fact, it means you do have to save the child because no one else will. And if you do nothing, then the child will be, the child will die. The child will drown. So it's, Singer thinks even with other people around also doing nothing, uh, the, the case is still the same. The fact is, if you save the child, your pants get wet and the child survives. If you don't save the child, your pants stay dry and the child dies. He says, even if there are other people making the choice not to help, you still have the same choice in front of you. That doesn't change what your options are. It's still step in and save the child to, and ruin your shoes or do nothing and let the child die. The, the fact other people are standing around doesn't change that. So other people's inaction, other people's refusal to help or failure to help does not get rid of your moral obligation to save the child. That's, Singer argues this. This is Singer's claim. He says, other people's inaction, other people's failure to help the child does not make it okay for you to fail to help the child. You still have a moral obligation to save the child, even if there are other people who could help but aren't. So other people standing around being able to help and not helping doesn't change whether or not you have to help. Now, so we've asked, Singer gave the original case and asked, uh, is the child, do we have an obligation to save the child? And he said the answer is yes. And then he considered some follow-up questions, some changes. One is, what about your pants and shoes? Uh, if you really like those pants and shoes and they're valuable pants and shoes, is it okay not to save the child? He says, uh, no. In that case, you still have to save the child. Small sacrifices don't matter in whether or not you have to save the child. Then his second question was, uh, what if other people are standing around and can help? Then, but they aren't helping. Then is it okay for you not to save the child? And he says, no. Other people not helping doesn't change your moral obligation. And now he's asking a third follow-up question, a third change to the thought experiment. Does it matter if you're far away from the child, if you're physically far from the child drowning? 
does it matter how far away the child is? So suppose that the child is thousands of miles away and that you can save them from drowning just by pushing a button. So if you push this button, I don't know, a little robot claw like a claw machine in an arcade will reach into the lake and pick up the child and the child will survive. If you don't push the button, then the child drowns. So it's just like before, except now you're pushing a button instead of walking into the lake. Do you have an obligation to save the far away child? Do you have a moral obligation to push the button and save the child? Even though, even though the child's far away. So in this case, in the original case, the child's right in front of you, drowning in a lake. Now the child is thousands of miles away and all you have to do is push a button. Do you have an obligation to save the far away child? That's the new question. Singer says, yes, yes, you do. You still have an obligation to save the child's life, even if the life you're saving is far away from you. Even if the child is not directly in front of you, the fact that you can save the child's life means you should save the child's life. Pushing the button is not a great sacrifice. You're not killing anyone else in order to save the child. You're just pushing a button to save the life of a drowning child thousands of miles away. And Singer says, yes, distance does not matter. It doesn't matter how far away from you the child is. If you can easily save the child from dying, then you have a moral obligation to do so. It's not like if a child is drowning 10 feet away from you, you have to save the child. But if the child's 11 feet away from you, oh, then you don't have to save the child. Then it's not your problem. Like that's not, that's not how morality works. How, how many feet away from you someone is doesn't affect whether or not you should save their life. Uh, how many miles away from you they are doesn't affect whether or not you should save their life. Uh, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't become okay to murder anyone once they're far away from you. So why would it suddenly be okay not to save their life when they're suddenly far away from you? So distance makes no moral difference. This is Singer's phrase, the way he phrases it. Distance makes no moral difference. The distance between you and the child does not make a difference to your moral obligation to save the child. Whether they're right in front of you or a thousand miles away, you still have the same obligation to save the child. Whether they're close or far, it doesn't matter. So, so we've said, if a child's drowning in a lake in front of you, you ought to save that child. And we've said, if it means ruining your shoes, giving up your pants and shoes, you still ought to save the child. If other people could help but aren't, you still have to save the child. If the child is far away from you, you still have to save the child. And so Singer thinks, if you agree with all that so far, then you agree now that you have an obligation to give all of the money that you don't need for survival essentials to charity. All of your money that you aren't spending on keeping you alive now has to be donated to charity. And probably you can't have any free time because you could be using that free time to work and earn money. And then you could donate that money and save more lives. So Singer thinks around the world, there are children dying from preventable diseases, right? This is one of the background assumptions from the beginning. Uh, there are children dying from preventable diseases and from famine and from lack of clean water and from lack of sh uh, shelter and other sort of preventable issues. So around the world, there are children dying preventable painful deaths. That's just an empirical fact. And by donating money, you can save the lives of some of them. You won't save all of them, but you'll save some of them. Uh, I think, I, 
I looked up the rate at one point, and if you donate money to uh, malaria net charities, then every few thousand dollars you donate, a child who would have died from malaria now lives a full healthy life and dies, you know, as an adult from old age type stuff. So what basically every few thousand dollars uh, on average saves one child's life. So they, instead of dying in childhood of malaria, they live to adulthood and never get malaria and live a full healthy life. So, you know, you figure the median income in the United States is I think uh, about $55,000 a year. Uh, let's say $5,000 is saves a child's life. That's 11 children a year. Uh, the median income in the country, that's 11 children a year. And people live on a lot less than that in America, in New York, uh, and in you know surrounding areas. You can live on a lot less than $55,000 a year. So if you can live on, say, $30,000 a year or $20,000 a year, well, that means you're saving, let's say you live on $30,000 a year. That means you're saving the lives of about five children a year, every year, forever. So every $5,000 you spend on something that doesn't save a child's life, that's one dead child that you could have saved and chose not to. If you buy a used car for $5,000, all right, you have chosen to have a car rather than to save a child's life. That's Singer thinks that's how we should be looking at it once we see this uh, drowning child analogy. So he says, Ch children around the world are dying of preventable diseases and you can save the lives of some of them. And you'll have less money as a result because you'll have to donate some of your money. But as long as you still have enough money to live on, you haven't given up anything nearly as important as the child's life. Taking the subway everywhere instead of driving in a car, that's worth the life of a child. Uh, not going on vacation one year or ever again, that's worth the life of the child you'll save. Uh, not having more than like five shirts and a pair of jeans and shoes, that's worth not having nicer clothes or more clothes, that's worth the life of the child that you could save by donating the money you would have spent on clothes to charities, to life-saving charities. That also means donating to charities that aren't saving lives is morally wrong. If you uh, graduate from college and then you donate to your alma mater as an alumnus or alumna, as an alumni, you donate to your college afterwards. Well, that's money that you donated that didn't save a single life. You could have donated that money to saving children's lives, to vaccinating children and giving them malaria nets and providing food and clean water. So lots of things that we do now in society, Singer thinks are morally unacceptable because we could spend that money on saving children's lives. And instead we spend it on cars and clothes and furniture and uh, going out to eat and uh, all sorts of unnecessary expenditures that do not help our survival and are not worth the, die the deaths of children that uh, result from it. We could save the lives of children around the world with our money. And instead we spend it on, uh, you know, coffee and sneakers. And that Singer thinks is morally unacceptable. Once we realize this analogy and we see it and we sort of see this clearly, uh, then we should recognize that it's not morally acceptable to live the way we've been living. We cannot spend money on non-essential things.
because the, anything we spend on non-essential things could be spent saving children's lives. If you have a cell phone, that's, you spend money on the phone and you sp pay a cell phone bill every month, that's money that could go towards saving children's lives. Uh, if you live in an apartment that is bigger than the absolute smallest apartment you could afford to live in, if you live in a neighborhood that where rent is more expensive than the cheapest neighborhood you could live in, that's money that could be going to save a child's life. And instead, you're spending it on non-essential things. So we're all, you, me, your family, your friends, my family, my friends, my colleagues, we're all living reprehensibly, according to Singer's argument. Nothing that we spend money on, or almost nothing that we spend money on, is worth as much as the life of a child. And we are choosing to spend it on this non-essential stuff rather than spending it on saving children's lives. So the vast majority of what we buy is not as valuable as a child's life, Singer thinks. And as a result, spending the money on these less valuable things, spending the money on ourselves rather than on saving children's lives is morally wrong. Just like we had a moral obligation to ruin our sneakers and save the drowning child, we have a moral obligation not to buy those sneakers in the first place and save a child dying of preventable diseases uh, around the world. We ought to make the small sacrifices of living uh, simpler, cheaper lives and donate that money instead. We should be donating the majority of our income as long as you're making more than you need to survive. Uh, whatever you need to survive, like the bare minimum, that's what it's okay to spend on yourself. That's the amount that it's okay to spend on you. Everything above that, that needs to be donated because anything ab you, you spend above that sort of bare minimum survival line is not as valuable as a child's life. And so you should not let children die in order to spend the money on yourself. Now, Singer says, look, you're not the only one who could donate. If everyone donated as much as Singer's suggesting, or even half as much as Singer's suggesting, then we would rid the world of preventable disease. Uh, but they're not doing that. So you're not the only one who can donate. There are lots of other people who could help. And there are people who can help way more than you since they have way more money than you. I mean, I've seen the class roster. Uh, none of you are named uh, Jeff Bezos or Bill Gates or Mark Zuckerberg or Warren Buffett. Uh, there are people with more money than you and they could help way more than you. And the fact that they're not, it makes their lives and their choices morally unacceptable, according to Peter Singer. But just like in the drowning child case, other people standing around and not helping is not an excuse for not helping. The fact that other people who could help are doing nothing does not mean that it's okay for you to do nothing. It wasn't okay in the drowning child case and it's not okay in the money donation case. You still have to help. You still have a moral obligation to donate more money to charity so that you can save child, children's lives. So other people failing to donate does not mean that you don't have to donate, Singer says. And so I mentioned some real world numbers before, uh, but just to recap, I think it's about every thousand dollars or every $5,000, $3,000, I've seen different estimates. Uh, every few thousand dollars donated to a malaria net charity uh, saves the life of a child. So every $1,000, $3,000, $5,000 you spend on stuff you don't need, a child who you could have saved will die. So if you could afford uh, $1,400 in rent and instead you live in a smaller room for $800, uh, I mean, I don't know what neighborhood uh, you're living in where these are both options, but let's say hypothetically you 
move to rent. Uh, yeah, you you could definitely get a room for eight hundred dollars. I I'm doing it now. It's fine. Uh, so you can if you can afford fourteen hundred dollars in rent, uh, then paying only eight hundred dollars in rent will save you seven thousand dollars a year. And that would save the lives of multiple children every year. And that's just one cutback. That's not even like living on nothing but uh, the cheapest food you can buy at the grocery store. That's not a ramen noodle only diet yet. Like you can make much bigger sacrifices than, uh, of, you know, sharing an apartment with a bunch of roommates for the rest of your life. That's fine. So Singer says, this is just like the drowning child case. Children are dying and you can save some of them. You can't save all of them, but you can save some of them. So the things you would sacrifice uh, by donating as much of your money as you can to charity, you would sacrifice some stuff. Your life would be worse. Let's be honest about it. You would be less happy. Your life would be worse. But none of the things you give up would be as valuable as a child's life. You having a sort of more austere, uh, sort of cheaper existence for the rest of your life is worth saving tons of children's lives. Whether it's getting your shoes wet in the lake or donating money instead of buying new shoes, a child's life is more valuable than shoes. So whether we're talking about sacrificing in the late case or in the charity case, the sacrifice is worth it, Singer says. A child's life is always more valuable than shoes or uh, restaurant dinners or uh, pants or a new computer or a new phone or whatever. So even if other people aren't helping, that doesn't mean that you don't have to help. Uh, other people not helping doesn't mean it's okay for you not to help. It wasn't okay in the lake drowning child case. It's not okay in the global charity children dying preventable deaths case. And the children are far away from you most of the time. But like we said before, Singer argued, distance makes no moral difference. So the children being far away from you is not an excuse not to save them. So therefore, just like in the drowning child case, you have a moral obligation to help. Not helping would be immoral. Not donating money to life-saving charities is immoral. And that's Singer's conclusion here. That's what Singer's arguing for. Not donating money that you could donate to charity. Not donating it to charity is wrong. It is morally wrong. It is a moral obligation to donate more money to charity than most of us do, or any of us, as far as I know. Uh, it is immoral to spend money on non-essential goods. Anytime you spend money on something you don't need to survive, you're letting children die when you have an obligation to save that child. That's Peter Singer's argument. And again, this applies to all of us. This applies to you, me, my family, my friends, your family, your friends, Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos, their family, their friends, everyone. And so Singer thinks we really have a moral obligation to live this austere life and donate as much money as we can to charity. And possibly to like specifically get jobs as hedge fund managers or something where we make as much money as we can possibly make and then donate as much of it as we can possibly donate. That might be what we have a moral obligation to do. And so th that's a really strong claim. I want us to sit and think and appreciate how strong that is. That means everyone you know is living an immoral unacceptable life. Every person you know, every person in your life, the ones you like and the ones you don't, are morally bad on Singer's view, or at least the choices they're making are morally bad. 
And so some people have said, this just means that Singer's moral view is too demanding. Uh, you can never even take a vacation because you could have spent that time working. And that means more money to save starving children. That's a lot. That means days off are morally wrong. And that's, that's a strong claim. That's a very strict version of morality, a very strict view of morality, of what our moral obligations are. And so some people have said, look, that just seems implausible. It seems obviously false that our moral obligations could be so strong that we can never take time and money to enjoy for ourselves. It's always morally wrong to spend money you earned on things that uh, you enjoy that aren't necessary for survival. So that seems implausible. So a lot of people have said that must be false. But Peter Singer's response is, yeah, that's a shame, but it doesn't change your obligations. I'm still right about the drowning child case. I'm still right that distance doesn't matter. I'm still right that you're not sacrificing anything as valuable as a child's life. I'm still right that other people not helping doesn't give you a reason not to help. My argument still goes through. It's a sound argument. And so I'm right that you, we have this moral obligation. So people are dying, not helping them is immoral. So you have the choice between enjoying luxuries, and this is a very broad notion of luxury that includes like coffee, because no one needs coffee to survive. Uh, so you have a choice between enjoying luxuries while children die, or living a less comfortable life while those children live. And he thinks if you choose luxuries for yourself while children die, then you are doing something morally wrong. And he thinks his argument for it is still sound. The premises are all true. All the steps are valid. So therefore, he thinks the conclusion still stands. You have a moral obligation to donate as much money as you can spare to saving children's lives. You should, given these options between personal enjoyment and children dying preventable deaths, or children surviving and you uh, living an austere, uh, uncomfortable lifestyle. He thinks you should choose the option with fewer dead children. That's, he thinks at the end of the day, that's what you ought to be doing. Uh, no matter how many uh, nice appealing luxuries and fun activities you put in the, the not donating option on the scale children dying is still more important preventing that is more important than enjoying uh free time and spending money on things you like so recap singer says you have a moral obligation to save the life of a child if they are dying right in front of you and you can help That's his premise. He just says and assumes that we all agree in the drowning child case, you have a moral obligation to save the life of the child. So then it doesn't matter whether or not the child is in front of you. Geographic distance makes no moral difference to your obligation. And it doesn't matter whether or not other people can help. If they're not helping and you can help, you still have a moral obligation to help. And it doesn't matter whether or not it will be inconvenient to you. It doesn't matter if you will be sacrificing comfort and happiness and money and time in your life, because what you are sacrificing is not as valuable as the life of a child. And so you have a moral obligation to save the life of the child. And Singer says there are, as a matter of fact, there are lots of dying children in the world. Lots of children are dying preventable deaths in the world. And you can save them by donating money. So therefore, it says from these premises, which I've argued for, it follows that you have a moral obligation to donate all of your money to life-saving charities. Unless that money is being used to keep someone alive, like you or your family or your children. Uh, money you need for survival for yourself and the people you're responsible for, you can keep. But 
additional money, money that isn't necessary for your survival, that needs to be donated to life-saving charities. Right. So that's Peter Singer's drowning child argument. And if he's right, then we're all living uh, immoral lives, uh, me included. Uh, we're all living immoral lives, according to Peter Singer's argument here. So we need either to find where the argument goes wrong or we need to start living our lives differently, very differently. So we have to pick, is the argument right and we have to go on living our lives differently or is the argument wrong? Uh, and if so, where does it go wrong? Uh, does distance matter? That seems weird. Uh, do you not have an obligation to save the life of the, even in the drowning child case where there's a child drowning in front of you? That seems definitely wrong. Uh, it, is Singer wrong that uh, your shoes are worth less than a child's life? That seems wrong. A child's life seems like it's definitely worth more than a pair of shoes. So something has to give here, but none of the options, none of the obvious ways of getting out of the argument seem appealing. So I want you to spend some time thinking about this. Uh, you just turned in unit assignments today. Uh, so no weekly assignment this week, so take some time off, no writing uh, this week, but think about it. Try to think through this argument uh, and see if you think there's a place where it goes wrong. And if so, where? Because if we, uh, want to keep living our lives the way we've been living them, uh, then we need to find a flaw in this argument. If there are no flaws, then we've all been living our lives wrong and we need to make significant changes. All right. All right. So that's Singer's argument. Uh, that's all we're talking about this week. Uh, I know this lecture always sort of ends with uh, Singer saying that we're all terrible people and talking a lot about dying children. So it can be a little depressing. Uh, and I accept that and I understand that. And I apologize uh, for that. It, this is a bit of a downer lecture. I accept that. Uh, and I'm sorry for that. Uh, next week, we will talk about uh, some more fun stuff uh, that's a little less depressing and a little less about how we might all be bad people. Uh, but uh, if you have any questions about this material, please email me or come to office hours. Let me know. I will do my best to help you uh, in any way I can. Otherwise, I will see you in the next video.